Are you ready? Summer has begun. Hi, I'm Rich Lund. Still just a guy trying to help out the monarch butterflies. And it is time to talk 2025 population status. We've had some good news, but buckle up. This will still be a bit of a sobering episode. Let's get into it. For the monarch population that is east of the Rockies, the numbers are in for their amount of area that they overwinter near Mexico City. You might remember that last year we were at a very, very startling 0.90 hectares of area. This year, the population en masse added up together has actually doubled, or essentially doubled, from 0.90 hectares to 1.79 hectares. So this is a very awesome win, something worth celebrating, and the fact that the population was able to double does showcase, yet again, the resilience of the monarch butterfly. If there's milkweed for it and nectar-producing flowers, the monarch butterfly population will fill whatever space we allow for it. But still, why am I not as excited as maybe a lot of other avenues of the internet on this one? I mean, don't get me wrong, this is really good news, and we're not looking at a decrease. We're looking at an increase, and it's, it's doubled the population. That's pretty awesome. But I'm trying to keep this in perspective. This here is, yes, a very awesome, absolutely necessary step in the process of getting us out of these very low numbers. It seemed like when this news broke, it seemed to me that there were plenty of headlines that were, in a way, almost over-celebrating this. Ready to pop the champagne cork as if we were crossing a finish line, and, and we definitely are not. Headlines akin to, Monarch Populations Double, or... Monarch Butterfly has 100% population recovery, or Monarchs rebound by 100%. Such headlines, depending on how they're worded, can be misleading. In other cases, just downright manipulative. My objective view? The gain, a doubling in the population, is a victory. But it's one hurdle of many to get over before we get out of disparity. First, short term, just looking at the last five years. 1.79 hectares, that's easy to see, it's a nice rebound almost back into what seems like a, a more stable two point something hectares. But now, longer time span view, taking in the last 14 years or so. This value, 1.79 hectares, it fits in pretty easily with a typical rise and fall. But this is still definitely a much lower number than we'd like to see in order to feel anything towards comfortability. Now, admittedly, doubling the population is still awesome. But when your population was only 0.9 hectares in the first place, doubling it does not mean a tremendous number of monarch butterflies have, have now reappeared in our population size. When you look at 14 years of data and you see that being under 2.0 hectares, I just, I can't help but think back to the start of the Raising Monarch series and what things were like then. 0.67 hectares, 1.13 hectares was the next year and we weren't celebrating. There was a lot of work to be done. And we're kind of in a very similar spot again, right here, right now. 0 0.90 hectares has become 1.79 hectares. Yes, the population doubled, but we are still at under 2 hectares. And so saying something like, the monarch populations have rebounded 100%, well, people have that 100% number in their head thinking, oh, 100% means problem solved, I got an A+, plus, 100%. No, it means our population, which was small, doubled. Well, if it's small and it doubles, that means the increase is small, too. I look at this number a lot less from the framing perspective of we've doubled the population and much more from the perspective of we have a low population, we have increased it, and this is just the first step out of that 23-24 low. Now, much even larger view. When we look at all 31 years of data, we can see that there's only been six times that we've been under two hectares of area. Worthy of note, for sure, all six of those times have been in the second half, the most recent half of those 31 years. And two of those six times have been this year and the past year. So nope, we're not crossing a finish line. We're not starting to cross a finish line. If anything, this is like the population size increasing means we've opened the bear trap and our wounded leg now this year, we still have to pull out from that bear trap in order to get it to start healing. A little bit gruesome, but I'm sticking with that analogy. I don't know, like, last year's 0 .90 hectares, a lot of the headlines were, were treating it like it was over for the monarch. And I got a lot of people responding, uh, enjoying the population status video from 2024, because I had much less of a doomsday approach. And now, 
it feels like it's the other way where all these headlines are like, yeah, we did it. And I'm having to be the guy like, no, we didn't. We, we still have a lot of work to do. So please, don't get me wrong. I am very excited that we had an increase and we're not staring down the barrel of a decrease from 0.9 hectares. No, we had an increase, the population doubled. Like, these are awesome wins. I'm just trying to keep a very objective view of it. So yeah, I mean, let's still, let's feel good about this good news. But also, well, go back to the, you know, 14 years of data. Keep in mind, during this time, we have seen decreases in the population in just one season due to severe weather events. Severe storms during migration, severe droughts when we need nectar-producing flowers, be it on the migratory path or just when they're coming up to lay eggs, all those things can really affect the monarch population. And we have seen in those 14 years of data times where a year's loss due to such extreme weather events has been above 1.79 hectares. Perhaps though, it's because I'm burdened with knowledge that many others are burdened with as well that puts us into a larger context. Some new findings came out this year just about pollinators in general and some from a long-term study and the news isn't that great. Why well, say it's not that great? It's, it's not that great. It's, it's on the other side. It's bad. See, even I want to try to soften the blow on this one. To look at the monarchs as a whole in North America, while yes, this series has certainly focused on the monarchs east of the Rockies, we can't not talk about both populations to see how this is all fitting in together and what the conservation efforts are and should be in the U.S. So while the eastern population has doubled, the western populations, no one's celebrating over there. When it comes to the count of the western monarch populations, an excellent source of trust is the Xerces Society. Similar to how the eastern monarch population size can be counted and estimated based upon the amount of hectares of area that they occupy near uh, Mexico City, western monarchs, they also migrate. Places along the, the west coast, pocket areas in some forest lands, and there's just a lot more different sites that they know of that they have to go count. Point being, numbers of the western populations are estimated in a reasonable similar manner to how the eastern population is also estimated and kept track of. And the Xerces Society publishes this western monarch count data each year. And according to the Xerces Society's 28th annual western monarch count, the overwintering populations when all added up together, that size was just over 9,100. And that's a very sharp decline. To put that in context and understand sharp declines like this have happened before, still 9,100 is very low when typical counts over the past 10 years have been around 200,000. On the west coast and in the immediate inland areas, large droughts and large widespread wildfires, which, which certainly are the results and made easier due to drought, these droughts and wildfires hurt the population in the form of habitat loss. Both nectar producing flowers that were the food for the monarch and then also the host plant for the larva, the milkweed that's out there. There's less than 10,000 monarch butterflies on the west coast. It's a number to take very serious. And the question this year remains, the same question that's there each year. Are those 9,100 or so, are they going to be coming back to more milkweed, more nectar producing flowers, or less? After wildfires and droughts, it's pretty tough to see that they're coming back to more. And again, that's where a lot of work has to be done. I wish not to be an alarmist. Again, look at the context of the eastern population size was able to double. As long as we've got the room there for it, as long as we have the resources for them, the monarch is resilient. But looking at a number of 9,100, I mean, there's just a few things that could go wrong that could really decimate that number. It's something to watch closely. Now, next, beyond just monarchs, looking at all North American butterflies as a whole. Recently published studies on butterfly counts for different species and a study that conglomerated a lot of this data all together have shown a loss in the North American populations of butterflies, all the ones that were counted across the board. Looking at North American butterflies as a whole, we've lost about 22% of them since around the 90s. And this isn't a case of some species went up while others just went down and it still averages out to a decline. It's a case where essentially every species that's been counted is in a decline. Butterflies, truly, they are like the canary in the mine shaft. I think that that canary analogy gets overused often, but this is a very fitting one. Butterflies are a really easy, convenient way to keep track of kind of the rest of the pollinators. They are a lot easier to see because of their wing patterns and flight display. And because they're larger and easier to see, this makes them a lot easier to count than other species of insects out there. 
Furthermore, because their wing patterns are distinct from species to species, with a couple of lookalikes out there, counting an individual species is pretty easy to do compared to other insect species and families that are out there. The butterfly is just ideal for keeping track of how pollinators are doing. And if we're seeing that across a 30, 40 year time span, the butterfly's populations are declining, it's a pretty logical thing to conclude that that's happening to a lot of the rest of pollinators out there too. And when we look, yep, we're finding there's plenty of evidence suggesting the same things for the other pollinators. Another pollinator we humans love to watch is the honeybee. Any type of bee pollinator is certainly important to our ecosystem. And the honeybee, be it from commercial hives or not, they still often feed on wild source nectar. A recent Washington State University release projected that commercial honeybee hives, they could be facing a 60 to 70% projected loss in numbers just in this year, 2025 alone. And whether that number is exactly 60 or 70% or somewhere in between or even somewhere outside of that, we'll find out this year. But still, it's a pretty dire situation to even be projecting that such a loss to that level is going to happen. It's 2025, we've got a lot more scientists looking at this, studying this, and we've got even more data to look at. And it seems that for butterflies, pollinators in general, and yes, our beloved monarch as well, things are looking grim. They're all suffering, and they're suffering greatly. As always in these studies, the data is just, here's the numbers, here's how much we've lost. It doesn't come earmarked with, here's the reason why. To figure that out requires a whole lot of well, cross studies and examination and learning about the problem, and ever changing. But still, the overwhelming scientific consensus is that this is all due to a loss of habitat. A loss of wild nectar producing flowers, and a loss of other associated host plants with the life cycle, such as milkweed for the larval stage of the monarch. This loss of habitat is directly linked to human activity, both in the use of pesticides and herbicides, and extreme weather events caused by climate change. It's 2025. We have more scientists looking at this than just 10 years ago. With more studies, with more data, we have more to look at. And it's not looking pretty. Pollinators, they desperately need our help. So now, please, don't get me wrong. If you've been excited about this increase of numbers that maybe you heard about before this episode came out, believe me, I am celebrating with you. This episode was not meant to dampen such excitement. I, too, celebrate this doubling of the population, and it's because of hard work and efforts of restoring the habitat that we have that we've got the number to look at, rather than a lower one. But at the same time, work and plenty of it lies ahead. Our pollinators, monarchs included, they need food, the nectar-producing flowering kind. This season, I'll be taking my own advice as I reform this uh, less eye-appealing rock garden into some re-established habitat for the monarchs. For me, it's definitely about getting the milkweed in there first, but we'll see what other kind of nectar-producing flowers we can use that are native to Michigan that'll help benefit all the pollinators. And I will certainly be showing such progress as some future episodes come out. We're taking this all in. Yes, we had a win, but monarchs, pollinators, they're on some shaky legs right now. If you've been waiting to decide if you want to help or not, the, the time is now. And the number one way to help is to restore habitat. Planting milkweed, planting nectar producing flowers native to your location, this is the number one way to help them. What slice of your yard, if you have one, can you give up? What slice of a community park might you be able to help maintain in order to help out the pollinators? Food for thought as we continue to strive forward. I'm Rich Lund, staying the course. I want to thank you so much for your, your help, your efforts, your interest in the monarch butterfly and its conservation. Happy start to a new season for you. I hope things are going well. West Coast, we feel you. Hearts are with you. But let's keep at it. Let's do this. I will see you next time.